أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ثم أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وهو القاهر فوق عباده ويرسل عليكم حفظة حتى إذا جاء أحدكم الموت توفته رسلنا وهم لا يفرطون صدق الله العلي العظيم الله سبحانه وتعالى in ayah number 61 of surah al-an'am he says and he is the dominant over his servants and he sends guardians over you until when death comes to one of you, our messengers take him and they do not neglect their duties. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse begins by mentioning one of his divine names. As you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has 99 official names known as Al Asma Al Husna. There are ahadith that also mention, mention this. Inna lillahi tis'a wa tis'ina isma. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has 99 names according to a tradition from the Holy Prophet. And He says, He who enumerates them will be admitted into paradise. He who understands them and is familiar with them, such a person will be among the inhabitants of paradise. So here in this ayah, Al-Qahir is mentioned. Al-Qahir is one of the 99 names of Allah and it, it literally means the dominant one. Now here, Al-Qahir essentially means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala transcends His creation in both His knowledge, as we found in ayah number 59 where Allah says وَعِنْدَهُ مَفَاتِحُ الْغَيْبِ لَا يَعْلَمُهَا إِلَّا هُ that with Allah is the keys of the unseen no one knows the unseen but Him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also dominates and transcends His creation in power as we found in, in ayah number 60 of Surah Al-An'am where Allah speaks to us about how He dominates us and overwhelms us with death so you find that Al-Qahir is the one who dominates in such a way where the dominated doesn't even have power to resist. He dominates us with his all-encompassing knowledge and he also dominates us with his infinite power and might. It's interesting that when you look in the Holy Quran, there are a number of verses where this attribute is mentioned, where this divine name is mentioned you find that when nabi yusuf السلام, was in prison he began to teach his fellow inmates certain aspects of allah's oneness certain aspects of tawheed and you find in surah yusuf verse 39 yusuf السلام, essentially teaches them Allah's quality of being Al-Qahir. He says, for example, in ayah number 39 of Surah Yusuf, Ya sahibay as-sij, O my two companions in the prison, A'arbabun mutafarriquna khayrun amillahu al-wahidu al-qahar. Yusuf says, is it better to have multiple gods who are in conflict with one another who are who are in disagreement or is it better to worship the one god who is what who is al qahar so you find that understanding allah's qahiriyyah 
his dominance over his servants is crucial to truly understanding monotheism. So here you see that Nabi Yusuf السلام, in the prison is highlighting this name of Allah as, uh, as being Al-Qahir. One of the ways in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifests his dominance over us is that what? وَيُرْسِلُ عَلَيْكُمْ حَفَظَةً that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the ways he exercises and demonstrates his qahiriyya, his dominance over us, is that he sends guardians upon us. These guardians are a reference to the malaika, the angels that accompany each individual soul throughout our earthly life, and they are essentially commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to record the deeds of the human being. If you go to Surah Al-Infitar, Surah number 82 of the Quran, verses 10 through 12, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us more detail about these guardians, these hafadha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكُمْ لَحَافِظِينَ Again, the same word is being used. Allah says, وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكُمْ لَحَافِظِينَ Surely, above you, upon you, there are guardians. حَافِظِينَ Who are these guardians? Allah explains in ayah number 11. كِرَامًا katibin. They are noble scribes. Highlighting their accuracy they're accurate in the way that they take account in their recording of your deeds they are beings of full integrity and accuracy they know of what you do they have full awareness of your actions it's interesting brothers and sisters for those of us who recite dua kumayl on a regular basis, there's a line at the end of Dua Kumail where Amir al Mu'mineen السلام, speaks about this phenomenon of recording of the deeds. At the end of Dua Kumail, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to pardon us for all our sins. And then, specifically, the Imam teaches us to say, O oh Allah, forgive us wa kulla sayyatin. Forgive us for every sin. Amarta bi ithbati hal kiram al katibin. Forgive us every sin that you have commanded the noble scribes to record. There are hadith that say that when you commit a sin, the angels do not record that sin. They don't, they don't record that sin for the first seven hours. They wait for a period of seven hours and seven in the Arabic in classical Arabic refers to a lengthy period of time they don't record the deed until after seven hours to give you an opportunity to repent so here we're asking the Imam Ali we're asking Allah oh Allah forgive us those sins that we didn't immediately repent for and then the angels recorded them because we didn't take advantage of that grace period whereby the angels don't finalize the recording of that deed. وَكُلَّ سَيِّئَةٍ In Dua Kumail we read, أَمَرْتَ بِإِثْبَاتِهَا الْكِرَامَ الْكَاتِبِينَ Who are these kiram and katibin? In Dua we read, أَلَّذِينَ وَكَّلْتَهُمْ بِحِفْظِ مَا يَكُونُ مِنِّي O oh Allah, these are the ones whom you have instructed to preserve everything that comes from me. All of my actions. And you have made them, you have made these angels, these scribes, a witness over me, a witness over my actions in addition to my limbs, because my limbs are also witnesses against me. Oh Allah, but you are the one who is watching. And you are washahid lima khafi anhum. O Allah, you are the witness to that which has been concealed from them. 
وبرحمتك أخفيت وبفضلك سترت. Now, if Allah subhanahu wa taala in the Quran tells us يعلمون ما تفعلون that the angels know what you do. Why is it that Amir al-Mu'mineen and Dua Kumail is saying that, Oh Allah, you are the witness to that which has been concealed from the angels. The question is, what is concealed from the malaik? If the Quran tells us, Kiraman katibin ya'lamuna ma taf'alun. The ulama, the scholars, they say, Malaika are aware of what you do, but they are not aware of your evil thoughts. If someone ponders or has an evil intention, but they don't act upon it, the angels, they don't know about it. They don't know about your evil intentions until those intentions translate into action. This is why the Imam says, Oh Allah, out of your mercy, you concealed our thoughts from them and some of our evil intentions. And it's because of your grace that you have protected and you have guarded us from the people, that even people don't know our thoughts and our intentions. Now, the question is if Allah Azza wa Jal is all knowing and He sees us and He's aware of our inner thoughts, what is the purpose of assigning angels to record the deeds of human beings? Scholars have said that number one, it is only befitting that a king delegates tasks. We see this even in this temporal world. When a king says, I'm gonna build a hospital, for example, does the king actually go put on you know, uh, work boots, roll up a sleeve and actually do the work? No, they delegate because it's befitting for a majestic personality to work and do things indirectly through the agency of workers and staff members. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the king of kings and it is only befitting that he does things in an indirect way. It's suitable for his majesty. This is number one. Secondly, appointing malaika to record our deeds reinforces this notion that everything that we do is meticulously recorded. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to internalize this reality. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees everything that we do, but it, it puts more emphasis on the matter when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designated certain creatures in the form of malaika to preserve and record all of our actions. It creates more of that. It creates a more heightened sense of awareness in the human being of their actions. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُرْسِلُ عَلَيْكُمْ حَفَظَةً He sends guardians over us until death comes to us. Why? Because the job of these angels who are recording our deeds, their mission, their duty ends with death. Because the official recording of our a'mal ends when the soul leaves the body. This is when their job is essential, essentially finished. يُرْسِلُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَيُرْسِلُ عَلَيْكُمْ حَفَظَةً حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءَ أَحَدَكُمُ الْمَوْتِ تَوَفَّتْهُ رُسُلُنَا وَهُمْ لَا يُفَرِّطُونَ until death comes to one of you, our messengers take him and they do not neglect their duties. Now in the Quran, Rusul, messengers, usually refer to prophets. But here, it refers to angels. If you look at Surah Al-Hajj, Surah 22, Ayah number 75, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explicitly tells us that He appoints 
messengers from among the angels and from among people. So in the Quran, in the Quranic terminology, Rusul can refer to angels, a Rasul can refer to an angel, or it can refer to a human being who is a prophet who has a message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you go to Surah Al-Hajj, Surah 22, Ayah 75, Allah says, Allahu yastafi min al-malaikati rusula wa min al-nas inna Allah sami'un basir Allah chooses from among the angels messengers. So not all angels are messengers. There is a certain class of malaika who are given certain tasks and they're, they're given certain responsibilities that they have to carry out in the form of a divine message. Whether it's to reveal wahi to prophets or they're given a certain task that they have to fulfill, they are rusul and from among people. So the Quran can sometimes use the word rasul to refer to an angel and it can also refer to a rasul to refer to human beings like the messengers that we know of. Now in the present context, this ayah refers to angels who are sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to collect the souls of the deceased. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah, He says that I send messengers. Rusul is plural. Tawafatu rusuluna, our messengers, it's plural. However, if you go to Surah 32, ayah number 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that a single angel is responsible for the taking of souls. If you go to ayah number 11, Allah says, قُلْ Say, O Muhammad, يَتَوَفَّاكُمْ مَلَكُ الْمَوْتِ الَّذِي وُكِّلَ بِكُمْ ثُمَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ تُرْجَعُونَ Say, O Muhammad, it is the angel of death that takes your souls. He is the one who has been instructed who has been appointed to take your souls so how do we reconcile ayah number 61 where allah says we send our messengers to take their souls and in surah 32 ayah number 11 the angel that takes the soul is singular it's one angel the ulama they say that malakul maut is the angel of death is ra'il but the angel of death also has aids. The angel of death also has helpers. And he also, in some cases, may delegate the task of taking the souls to, to angels that operate under his command. There are some traditions, if I recall, and I wasn't able to actually find them, there are some narrations that indicate that Malak al the angel of death, directly takes the souls of only the supremely pious or the most wicked. So you have to be extremely pious for Malak al to take your soul or, or to be among the most wretched of Allah's creation. That's when he does it directly. But for the most, for the most part, other people, he delegates this task to the angels that operate under his command. Now there's an interest, there's a beautiful hadith where during the Prophet's mi'raj, many of us know that the Prophet, uh, he went on a, 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 a nightly journey and then he ascended to the heavens and he witnessed some of the most grand of signs. The tradition says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, when he was on his mi'raj, on his ascension, he met the angel of death. He saw Malakul Maut. And he asked the angel of death, Ya Malakul Maut, 
كَيْفَ تَقْبِضُ أَرْوَاحَ النَّاسِ O angel of death, how do you take the souls of people? The angel of death replied, saying, Ya Rasulullah, I have a long, I have a list, a long list. And the names of all people can be found on this list that I have. When the name of a, an individual erases, that's when I know that the life of this person has expired and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands me to take the soul. And he tells the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, the entire world, the entire dunya, is like a coin in my hand. Have you seen the coin? Or you can flip it in the palm of your hand. He says the entire world is like a coin in the palm of my hand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directs me to the individual whose time has expired and I simply command his soul to come to me and it departs. And then Malak al says, Ya Rasulullah, and I visit every person five times a day. There's a hadith where Malak al Maut he says, Innahu laysa fi sharqiha wa la fi gharbiha ahlu bayt madar wa la wabar illa wa ana atasaffahuhum fi kulli yawm khams marrat. Malak al Maut says, There is no house in the east or the west that I do not visit five times a day. What times are these? Rasulullah he explains. Faqala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ali innama yatasaffahuhum fi mawaqeet al salah. Rasulullah says, Malak al Maut. He doesn't only come to you on the day that you die. Malakul Maut visits you. He visits our homes five times a day at the time of Salah. 6 a.m., 4 a.m., 5 a.m. He's there at Salat al-Fajr. What, what are you doing at that time? He's there at the time of Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, and Isha every day for the entire duration of our lives. And then the Prophet says, فَإِن كَانَ مِمَّنْ يُوَاضِبُ عَلَيْهَا عِنْدَ مَوَاقِيتِهَا Rasulullah says, if you are the one who offers your prayers on time, لَقَّنَهُ شَهَادَةَ أَنْ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ The angel of death will dictate to him the shahada. He'll remind him because when you're in those last moments, many, many, many of you may have seen that the mayyit, the person who's dying, who's experiencing those final moments, their tongue often gets tied. They're experiencing crucial pain and they're not able to recite these adhkar. Rasulullah says, if you were an individual who was offering the prayers punctually, Malakul Maut will assist you in making your final declaration of faith. وَنَحَّى عَنْهُ مَلَكُ الْمَوْتِ إِبْلِيسِ And مَلَكُ الْمَوْتِ will repel Iblis from your presence. The last entity, the last being that you want around you when you're on your deathbed, deathbed is Iblis because Iblis wants you to stray. He wants you to die in a state of disbelief. He wants to inject doubt into your heart. So Malakul Mount, when he takes our souls, he actually knows us very well because he has been visiting our homes every day, five times a day. There are some of us, when he comes and visits our homes, we're performing our salah on time. He's monitoring our actions. We're being gentle with our family members. We're having mercy with those who are in our household. So when he comes to us after 50, 60, 70 years to take our souls, he does it with excitement. He's yearning for us. The ahadith say that Malakul Maut sits in front of the mu'min like a humble, obedient slave. 
But if for 50, 60 years, every time he comes to our homes, we're negligent about our prayers, we're harsh with our family members, we're listening to haram, we're seeing haram, we're engaging in unethical behavior, when he comes to us, he will despise us. And the withdrawing, the seizing of our souls will be something that is extremely painful. So you find in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I send my guardians to them until death comes to them and I send to them my messengers to take their souls. The angels, when Malakul Maut takes your soul, he's not negligent when it comes to this duty. He doesn't take your soul prematurely. And there's no delay, as Imam Jafar al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi he says, and I may have mentioned this in our early sessions when the Imam was asked, Ya ibn Rasulullah, why is it that sometimes I see individuals who die with their eyes open while others die with their eyes closed? The Imam alayhi salam, he says, as for the ones who died with their eyelids shut, Allah didn't give them enough time to open their eyes. And those who died with their eyes open, they weren't even given enough time to blink. Malakul Maut, there's no tafriyat, there's no ifrat. They're precise when they take the soul of the human being. Ayah number 62, Allah says, Thumma ruddu ila Allahi mawlahum al-haq. Then they are returned to Allah, their true master. Unquestionably, His is the judgment, and He is the swiftest, He is the swiftest of accountants. When we depart this world, we go back, we return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He Allah is our point of origin, he's our creator. We go back to our place of origin and we return to our real master, our real Mawla. You, as a human being, you're not even the master of your own soul, let alone having other masters, other human beings as masters. Your owner, your master is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You came from him. And to him you shall return. He is the only one who is qualified to judge you. Everyone else knows your vahir. They only know what you make visible to them. They know maybe some of your actions that you perform in the public domain. But only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is qualified to judge the human being. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not only, not only aware of our actions, but He's aware of our motives, of our intentions, of our inner thoughts. He has authority over everyone because He's our Creator. And Allah is the most swift in taking account. There are hadith from the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam where it seems that the Imams were asked by people that there are probably billions and tr trillions of people who will stand before Allah on the Day of Judgment. How is Allah going to judge all of these people? The Hadith says, إِنَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ يُحَاسِبُ عِبَادَهُ فِي مِقْدَارِ حَلْبِ شَاتِ Ahlul Bayt السلام, they say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge his servants on the day of judgment as quickly as one of you can milk a goat. It seems that this was an expression at that time among the Arabs as an idiom for doing something very quickly because it would take it would take the Bedouin Arab only a few moments to milk his goat. So Ahlul Bayt say, in the same way that it's so quick and easy for you 
to milk your goat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be very swift in his hisab of all of his servants on the day of judgment. In another hadith, we read, Inna Allah ta'ala yuhasibu al-khala'iq kullahum fi miqdari lamh al-basar. The hadith says that Allah will judge all creation on the day of judgment as quickly as the blinking of an eye. Now you may tell me, what about the ahadith that say that the day of judgment, there are 50 stations and every station is 1,000 years of questioning? These ahadith are referring to Allah's calculation of our good deeds and our bad deeds. That is something that's very fast. What will be very time consuming is us having to explain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala why we did such and such. Answering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's interrogation of our deeds. Account counting them, counting sayyat and hasanat, that's going to be a very quick process. But what will take a lengthy period of time is having people answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he questions them, when he starts asking them the whys. Why did you do this? Why did you usurp this right? Why did you fail in this responsibility? Why did you oppress fulan? Why did you, why did you not offer your prayers on time? Why did you cast that lustful glance? This is what will take an enormous amount of time. In another hadith, there was an individual who asks one of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, Ibn Rasulullah, how is it that Allah is going to judge all humanity on the day of judgment despite their large number? The Imam السلام, very beautifully responds in the same way that he sustains them at the same time despite their large number. Just like now, how many people are roaming the earth? Over 7 billion. Isn't Allah sustaining all of us? In the same way that He sustains all creation, in the same way He's Rabbil Alameen, and He is nurturing and nourishing and sustaining every being, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be able to be very swift in His reckoning on the Day of Judgment. Ayah number 63, قُلْ مَنْ يُنَجِّيكُمْ مِنْ ظُلُمَاتِ الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ تَدْعُونَهُ تَضَرُّعًا وَخُفْيَ لَئِنْ أَنْجَانَا مِنْ هَذِهِ لَنَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الشَّاكِرِينَ Say, O Muhammad, who rescues you from darknesses of the land and sea when you call upon him, imploring aloud and privately, if he should save us from this, we will surely be among the thankful. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 64, and I'll, I'll combine these two verses and then I'll offer my humble explanation. It is Allah who saves you from it. And from every distress, then you still associate others with him. Brothers and sisters, the Holy Quran gives several examples of people calling upon Allah for help in moments of great distress, only to forget and return to their state of polytheism when that moment of need and desperation passes. Now in this, in the present verse, some of the examples are connected with the perils that we, that human beings experience at sea. For example, when you look at Surah Luqman, Surah 31 verse 32, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَإِذَا غَشِيَهُمْ مَوْجٌ كَالظُّلَلٌ Traveling through the sea, brothers and sisters, especially at that time, it was the only way to reach some of the far regions of the earth. 
So a lot of the Arabs were actually familiar with navigating the sea and the dangers that they face when they embark on a ship. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds them, وَإِذَا غَشِيَهُمْ مَوْجٌ كَالظُّلَمٍ When you're out in the sea and the waves come over you like a dark shadow, like dark shadows, دَعَوُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ SubhanAllah, brothers and sisters, when human beings, and this is part of the fitra, even if someone is a, is a proclaims to be an atheist, when they experience moments of utter desperation and fear, and they're in that, that storm, Allah says, they, turn, they call upon me. They don't only call upon you, they call upon me with ikhlas. Even the kafir who rejects Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says, when they're in that moment, when, I, when they're experiencing severe tribulation and they really feel that they're going to perish, they, they call upon me with ikhlas, with sincerity. They, they really recognize me in that moment because all of the other times they feel like they're ghani. But in that moment, everyone has a heightened sense that they are faqir, that they are in need of Allah. فَلَمَّا نَجَّاهُمْ إِلَى الْبَرْ So they make the sincere supplication. They ask Allah to rescue them. They may not verbalize it, brothers and sisters. I'm not saying that if someone like Richard Dawkins is in the middle of the sea or he's in an airplane and the airplane is going down, he's going to raise his hands and make dua. But deep down inside of him, He's reaching out to a higher power, whether he wants to admit it or not, with ikhlas too. فَلَمَّا نَجَّاهُمْ إِلَى الْبَرِ But when they reach safety, when Allah rescues them, فَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَصِدٌ There are some of them who stop halfway. They have belief and disbelief. They start wavering. وَمَا يَجْحَدُ بِآيَاتِنَا إِلَّا كُلُّ خَتَّارٍ كَفُورٍ So the darkness of land and sea, if we go back to, the, to verse 63 of Surah Al-An'am, some commentators, they say that the darkness of land and sea may simply refer to the anxiety-producing vicissitudes of, of this life. Or it may be a metaphorical reference to the different types of darkness that we human beings experience in this life, including both inward and outward sources of fear, anxiety, and sadness. Whenever we experience these states, we feel that we are in need. When you, get, when you strip yourself of that sense of independence, when you truly feel dependent and in need, that is when you're able to sincerely reach out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's when you realize that you are makhluq, you have a khaliq, and that khaliq is ghani, and you are faqir. That's why many prisoner, many people who go to prison, they find Allah, because they're no longer distracted. They really feel their vulnerability and their insignificance and their smallness. They really sense their faqr. But people outside of the prison cell, they're distracted, they have a false sense of independence, power. That's why they don't have this God consciousness. There's an interesting Sufi interpretation that I'd like to share with you. And it's good for us to get exposure to different understandings of the Qur'an, some of the mystics and the Sufis, when they look at ayah number 63, they say that, and this is probably interp an interpretation that the likes of uh, you know, Mullah Sadra or even uh, Ibn Arabi may uh, uh, subscribe to. They say that Zulumat al-Bar refers to the adversity and the hardship we face by following sharia which is the islamic 
exoteric law. Whereas they say, the darknesses of the sea, and we know that if you look at the earth, only 30% is land, and the majority of it, of it is what? It's water, sea. Some of the Arafat, they say, the darknesses of the sea refer to the spiritual difficulties and challenges faced by those who are pursuing the mystical path. Tariqa. So you have Sharia, you have Tariqa, and then you have Hakika. Those who are trying to follow the esoteric laws of Islam, meaning they're trying to go beyond the fiqh, the, the halal and the haram. They want to go deeper. They're holding themselves to the mustahabbat and the makruhat, and they're trying to reach makarim al akhlaq They're engaged in jihad al nafs. Their struggles are more, are more in number, like the darknesses of the sea, because the darkness of the sea is more vast than the darkness of the land, because there's more sea than land. Now, brothers and sisters, it's interesting that the way that you attain sin true sincerity in your worship, in your dua, is to get to a level where you feel faqir and in need and desperate to Allah, even when you're not experiencing a moment of peril. Most people, your average person, the only time they, they really feel that they are faqir with relationship to with relation to Allah is when they go through an extreme tribulation, when they go through that darkness in the land and the sea. But we want to get to a point where we can develop this recognition that Allah is ghani and I'm faqir, whether I'm comfortable or I'm drowning in the middle of the sea. So in that moment. Most people feel that Allah is ghani and they are faqir. But the goal is to do what? To get to a point where I always, I'm keenly aware of my destitution towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the ayah ends with a claim that, Oh Allah, if you rescue us, we will be among a shakirin Now, the Urafa, they have an interesting conversation here. They say that look at the maqam of a shakirin You know, you and I, we have a very simple understanding of what it means to be grateful to Allah. We think that, you know, before I eat my food, I say, Alhamdulillah, Shukrullah, and that's it. The Urafa, they recognize that the maqam, the status, the station of gratitude and spiritual wayfaring is so high that you have to go through the darknesses of the land and the sea. You have to go through a lot of spiritual training to become among ash-shakirin. There's a hadith that I want to share with you. From the sixth Imam. And by the way, suffice as a testament to the rank of a Shakirin that Allah in the Quran He says, min and very few of my servants are the grateful ones. Shakur is a, uh, a hyperbole of gratitude, it's an exaggerated. Uh, Word, it's an exaggerated form of being grateful. In any case, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi says, Adna shuk, he says, the lowest level of gratitude, the lowest level of gratitude to Allah is what? The lowest station of gratitude is to know that every blessing comes from Allah without seeing, with, without even thinking that there's another cause for it. Being blind 
to the other asbab. So the first is recognizing that all bounties are from Allah, not from anything else. Second is to be content with what Allah has given you. This is also a dimension of gratitude, that you're pleased, you're content with what Allah has apportioned for you. And the third is that you do not use that blessing to disobey Allah. Part of being grateful to Allah is to recognize, to recognize that this ni'mah is from Him, this blessing is from Him, and to be content with that which has been given to you. To trust Allah's wisdom in what He has given to you. And thirdly, don't use that blessing to disobey Allah. Don't use that blessing to deter you from fulfilling your obligations and abstaining from things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden. And then in ayah number 65, Allah says, قُلْ هُوَ الْقَادِرُ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَبْعَثَ عَلَيْكُمْ عَذَابًا مِّنْ فَوْقِكُمْ أَوْ مِنْ تَحْتِ أَرْجُلِكُمْ أَوْ يَلْبِسَكُمْ شِيعًا وَيُذِيقَ بَعْضَكُمْ بَأْسَ بَعْضٍ انظر كيف نصرف الآيات لعلهم يفقهون Say, he is the one able to send upon you affliction from above you or from beneath your feet or to confuse you so you become sex and make you taste the animosity of one another look how we diversify the signs that they will under that they may understand in the previous verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was highlighting his oneness and his compassion for his servants. Here, Rasulullah is instructed to remind people that Allah is not only merciful and forgiving, but he's also severe in his chastisement. And there are three punishments that are cited, three types of punishment that are cited in this ayah. The first is عَذَابًا مِّنْ فَوْقِكُمْ Punishment from above. The Mufassirin of the Qur'an, they say that this could be a reference to torrential or flooding rains that Allah sends upon communities. Could be lightning, could be meteorite showers. If you take, for example, the community of Nuh, their adab came from above in the form of flooding rains. If you take the community, Qawm Lut, the community of Lut, their punishment also came from above in the form of stones that were raining from the heavens. This could have also been a meteorite shower that Allah afflicted them with. Other scholars say that this could also be a reference to Allah putting tyrants over you. When you abandon Amr bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar, the natural result of abandoning that obligation is that the most wicked become your rulers. Adab from above you, punishment from above you. وَمِن تَحْتِ أَرْجُلِكُمْ The second type of punishment is punishment which comes from beneath you, beneath your feet. This could be a reference to Earthquakes, you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He mentions that this was the way that He punished Qarun. Qarun was a relative of Musa alayhi salam. He was one of Bani Israel. Qarun and his riches was swallowed by the earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Qasas, Surah number 28, ayah number 81. He says, فَخَسَفْنَا بِهِ وَبِدَارِهِ الْأَرْضِ Allah says, Qarun, I made, I made the earth swallow him 
and his palace and his home. So this is an example of punishment from below, from beneath you. And then the last punishment that's mentioned here is what? Yalbisakum Shia, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes confusion among you so that you become into you come you become into sex and there is animosity between you. There is discord and division. Now it's interesting, brothers and sisters, you know, we talk a lot about the importance of the believers being united. It's amazing, brothers and sisters, that when you look at the danger of disunity, that disunity is mentioned along par with punishment from above, punishment from beneath us, and Allah mentions that if you do not hold upon the commandments of my prophets, especially Hadith al Thaqalain, where Rasulullah says, hold, upon, hold on to Quran and my Ahlul Bayt. If you do so, you will never go astray. But unfortunately, the Ummah, they abandoned the Ahlul Bayt and different sects started to form and Muslims started to fight against each other. This fitna is just as bad. The disunity, the sectarianism is just as severe as the punishment that was sent upon Nuh, upon Lut and the other communities. So it's amazing how damaging disunity and sectarianism is. It's mentioned alongside Adaban min fawqikum wa min tahti arjulihim. You find in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many verses exhorts the believers to be united and to avoid disunity. If you look at Surah Ashura, Surah 42, verse 13, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, شَرَعَ لَكُمْ مِنَ الدِّينِ مَا وَصَّى بِهِ نُوحًا وَالَّذِي أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ وَمَا وَصَّيْنَا بِهِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَمُوسَى وَعِيسَى أَنْ أَقِيمُ الدِّينِ وَلَا تَتَفَرَّقُوا فِيهِ And we have ordained upon you this faith which we have prescribed upon Nuh and we have revealed to you and we have revealed to Ibrahim and Musa and Isa. Allah tells all of these prophets that uphold the religion and do not be disunited. Allah revealed this to Nuh that this small group of mu'mineen try to make sure that there's no division among them. Allah revealed the same to Ibrahim, to Musa, to Isa, that the way that you preserve the message is that you do not fight amongst each other, especially do not let it ex escalate to the point where there's violence among the believers. This has to be avoided. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ali Imran in verse 103, the famous verse that we're all familiar with, وَاَتَصِّمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا And hold firm to the rope of Allah and do not be disunited. You find Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullahi alayhi, he made many personal concessions for the sake of preserving the unity of the Ummah. He did not want to see bloodshed in the Ummah. Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam in his wasiyah, he wanted to be buried beside his grandfather, Rasulullah. But in his wasiyah, he says to Imam al Hussein, if being buried beside my grandfather, Rasulullah, if there is resistance from certain individuals, then bury me someone else. I do not want this to be used as, as an excuse for there to be bloodshed among the Muslims. This was what was revealed to all of the prophets, that these mu'mineen, you have to make sure that you extinguish the fires of fitna and make sure that they are united. Because the enemies of Islam always aim to, to divide and conquer. This was the strategy of Fir'aun, and it's the strategy of every Fir'aun that came after the Fir'aun 
of Musa alayhi salatu was salam. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. We have some time for questions and answers. Okay. Thank you, Shay. Um, um, I have a couple of questions. Um, um, you explained um, how the um, the malaika can see us, uh, can see our actions. No. Um, and how the malakal mode is is visiting us five times a day. Mm -hmm. So now the question that that comes uh, into my mind is that if we have that uh, in in the back of our minds, if we don't forget that, how how can it be that um, we still uh, sin? How can it be that, that that we know that and we still uh, sin? Um, I, I want to see if we, if if we can maybe comment on that. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so my other question is on a different topic. So let, let me answer the first question. Now we have to understand that the expectation is not, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that we are fallible. The expectation is not that, that we will become ma'asumeen. But what is expected of us is that when we do sin, that we immediately repent. As the hadith says, the children of Adam make mistakes. They are fallible. They commit sins. But the best sinners are the ones who repent. So at the very least, being aware of the fact that Malakul Mawt is visiting us on a daily basis, at the very least, that should encourage us not to delay Tawbah. This should be our first step. That we get into the habit that when I do commit a sin, I immediately hasten towards seeking forgiveness. And then gradually, grad, because, what, because Shaytan, his most powerful tactic, as I mentioned in our previous sessions, is that he instills in us this sense of immortality that you know I'm, I'm not gonna die now my my neighbor's gonna die the other believers in the masjid they're gonna die my time is not gonna come now or in the near future this in and of itself is very dangerous so if we become aware of the fact that that iblis is visit that uh that malakul maut is visiting us daily this at the very least should encourage us to uh to repent. Uh, Shaykh, um, the it said it, the translation for one verse that Allah chooses from I uh, call the angels uh, messengers. Yes. Who? What a different. Do they also give us like a message? A message in this case, or would maybe some other word be a better translation for Rasul? You're saying, could they, do they give us messages? Yeah, because like even the angels that are being given, uh, are sent to like recorded deeds are called messengers. No, no. Again, not not all mess. Not all angels are messengers. This is only a certain group of angels that are messengers. So, for example, Jibrail obviously would qualify as a messenger because he's carrying. He's the trustee of revelation who's delivering Allah's message to human messengers. So he's clearly a messenger. The, the, the malaika on the, uh, the night of Qadr, تَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالْرُوحُ فِيهَا بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ مِنْ كُلِّ أَمْ These malaika on the nights of Qadr, they're carrying a message to the ma'asum of the time. In our case, it's to the, to the 12th imam. The angels that, for example, that that surround the believer when he's uh, in his last moments. There are some ahadith that say that the angel of death and perhaps even his aides, they uh, they basically uh, 
they comfort the believer in his uh, in his last moments. The hadith say that the malaika say they tell the believer that look and uh, and see the ahlul bayt, the ahlul bayt. They present themselves at that moment, so they could be carrying different messages. It's also possible that the angels inspire the individuals, as the Quran says. You know, the angels descend upon the believers and they they say to them, you know. Fear not and grieve not and have the glad tidings of the paradise that awaits you So there could be some angelic inspiration that a believer may experience So these are various messages that could potentially be carried by by angels Thank you Sheikh I had a question about verse 65 verse 65 yes so one of the punishments mentioned or one of the calamities that Allah can uh, can put to his people in this ayah is mentioned as like increasing the confusion between the sects and stuff yeah. like that. Um, but we are in a situation where we're already in multiple sects. Mm -hmm. uh, so is that is that a punishment that we're in? How how can we how can we form like more unity so that we get out of this situation it's it's very simple when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that discord and mutual animosity is a punishment what it means is that it's very simple when you defy and disobey my messenger who commanded you all to hold firmly to the Quran and to my Ahlul Bayt when you disobey this commandment, the, the divine punishment will descend upon you. And that's in the form of the proliferation of these different sects. When you give the microphone to, to, uh, to people other than the Ahlul Bayt, everyone is going to create his madhab. Abu Hanifa did it, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, others. So when, when you go against the divine commandment to obey, to follow the Quran, and to follow in the footsteps of the divinely appointed spokesman of the Quran, which is the Ahlul Bayt, you will be punished in, in, the, in the sense that there's gonna be there are gonna be sects that form, you're gonna be you're gonna it's gonna cause deviation and confusion. It's a natural consequence of turning away from that uh, that prophetic uh, instruction. Now, the way that we turn away from the, the way that we rectify this state of uh, of discord is that we have to gently and wisely introduce the islam of ahlul bayt you see brothers and sisters unity here doesn't mean that we say you know all of the companions of the prophet are noble and righteous and you know it's okay for you to pray salat with taraweeh and you know that's not what the ayah is saying. The ayah is not saying that, you know, when Allah says, وَاَتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا That hold firm to the rope of Allah and do not be disunited. It does not mean that we compromise our values. Because if you look at Amir al-Mu'mineen, in Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib's first year as the Khalifa, the first civil war among the Muslims happened on his watch. And we know Amir al-Mu'mineen is a champion of Islamic unity. But during his four-year khilafah, he fought three civil wars. What this means is, unity has conditions. And the condition is haq. We will never unite under batin. You find that the Imam alayhi salam was willing to coexist with the likes of the Khawarij. He even said to them that, listen, you can have your own beliefs about me, but I will fight you if, you if you're violent against other Muslims. So the way, so to answer your question, the way that we rectify this state of discord in the Ummah is that we have to bring them back to the Ahlul Bayt. And the way that we bring them back to the Ahlul Bayt is that we have to exemplify the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. We should not sever ties with other Muslims. 
We should have joint functions with them. Yes, for, for example, the birth of Rasulullah, we, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, believe 17th of Rabi'ul al -Awwal. Sunnis believe 12th of Rabi'ul al -Awwal. That week should be Islamic Unity Week. We should, have we should have joint programs as much as we can. As much as we can. We should not say things in a way that, that's insulting. We should not use vulgar language when we refer to certain personalities that they hold in high esteem. We should not shy away from discussing matters in an academic way, but we have to do it with respect, with kindness, with courtesy. We should be aware of certain sensitivities that they may have. And it really comes down to exhibiting the akhlaq that the Ahlul Bayt have taught us. Thank you. In the context of um, Ayah 62, I think um, you uh, mentioned that on the Day of Judgment, we will be asked uh, uh, to explain about uh, our actions. Yes. Um, so now my question is, if we, if we know that um, Allah knows um, every detail of our intention, what is the purpose of uh, us uh, standing there and explaining our actions? In one word, it's ma'amul that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, part of his justice dictates that he allows the human being to defend themselves. In the same way, in our court of law, even if the judge knows that the individual is guilty, justice dictates that you allow the defendant to offer an explanation. And it's also for the individual to, and now this doesn't mean that people are going to be able to lie on the Day of Judgment. It just means that there is no room left for anyone to point the finger at Allah and say, Oh Allah, you oppressed me. Allah will say, All of the evidence is before your eyes. There are witnesses to your actions. And on top of that, I will give you the opportunity to speak. You will be questioned. So these are all essentially aspects of divine justice. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, there are, there are certain individuals who, whose crimes are so heinous that the moment they get out of the grave, they go straight to Jahannam. But for the majority of people, they will, uh, they will be questioned, they will, they will have to respond. That's the system that Allah created on the Day of Judgment. So Allah's his, his attribute of being adil will be manifested to its fullest extent on that day. وَقِفُوهُمْ إِنَّهُمْ مَسْؤُولُونَ Ask them, make them stand on that day, for they shall be asked, they shall be interrogated. It's also for the human being to recognize that they are not being oppressed and Allah is just. That they're not being wronged. Um. Sir, another question. Um, in Ayah 63, um, you mentioned the, you explained the status of being uh, being grateful, the Maram of Shakreen. No. Um, so, uh, so now the question that comes to my mind is that um, this attribute or, or other attributes like being patient, uh, similar to this, um, these are things that, that may come from your education or the way your parents r uh, raised you. Um, so what is what is the value of, for some uh, you know um, what is the value of something that is was given to you and you didn't have to to choose it? If I you know if I come from a family that uh, that that uh, taught me how to be shaker, um, um, or the other uh, comparison would be if I you know come from a family that that didn't teach me that and I had to to uh, learn it myself or develop it so what is the value between these two Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's criteria for judgment will be different you know the, the way that Allah judges someone for example who grows up in a family where both parents are pious and he was exposed to all of these Islamic teachings the bar is naturally going to be set higher for that person Allah is going to be less lenient with a person who, who grew up in that environment that was conducive for his spiritual growth, as opposed to someone 
who didn't receive that parental that parental guidance. So the difference is that the bar is different. The, the hisab is not going to be the same. And this all goes back to Allah's justice. For example, someone who grows up in the inner city who did not have parents who guided him, do you think he's going to be held to the same standard as the, the, the children of a marja? Obviously not. The bar is different. Allah may be, may be more lenient towards, uh, towards the ones who didn't have that exposure. He may reward them more handsomely when those individuals do good. So the, the, the criteria for judgment, the standard is, uh, is different. Thank you very much, Sheikh. So this was a uh, for, for your time and for all these uh, your patient patient. Yeah. May Allah bless you, inshallah. Please keep me in your du'a, inshallah, and we'll see you guys uh, next week, inshallah. Right, Thank, you. Thank you very Thank much. You.